my friend Amanda. I met her on a panel and we were discussing stuff and I thought that our audience would uh, would enjoy hearing from her. So Amanda, let me have you introduce yourself a little bit. Sure. So my name is Amanda Terry. I'm co-founder and chief operating officer of Metagood. Metagood is the company behind NFT collection OnChain Monkey. And OnChain Monkey was launched in September 2021. We were the first profile pick collection all on chain in a single Ethereum transaction. Then we made history again in February as the first 10,000 NFTs inscribed on Bitcoin. We've created an incredible community around us that are very passionate about OnChain Monkey and that subscribe to the belief that Web3 can create wealth for a community, but also do real world good. The difference between Web2 and Web3, so you know, examples of Web2 would be you know, Facebook, even Twitter, where, you know, a company or their users are creating content for an audience. And then typically that content is being monetized, you know, through the eyeballs that watch it, right? And advertising. And I think the real difference between Web 2 and Web 3 is that actually the community, i.e. In, in our case, our NFT token holders, are contributing to the community, but they're also stakeholders, right? So they're not being monetized, i.e. their attention. They're actually, you know, we have, you know, NFT holders that actually hold our NFTs. And as our NFTs go up in value, as the community is stronger, as more brand awareness and, you know, the price of these NFTs go up, it kind of benefits all of the holders, not just Metagood, the company. So that's just one, one example of how I like to think of like kind of web two, web mm -hmm. three. So if you go into our Discord or Twitter, you'll see people type exclamation point rise, which stands for respect, integrity, sustainability, and enrichment. We've actually used a number of our secondary trading revenues to do real world good, which we can talk a little bit about as well. And you know we're very excited and bullish on building NFTs on Bitcoin. It's really the only or one of the few L1s that has not kind of gotten the benefit of NFTs to build the ecosystem. And mm -hmm. um, given our founding team, we have kind of unique competitive advantage to do that. So, you know, even let's even go back to the very beginning. You know, what were you doing before there was Web3? So I have about 20 years in kind of like Web2 digital media business development experience. I was at Twitter, I was at NBC, and then several startups that have been acquired. Um, now, when you're doing that, are you already committed to doing, you know, philanthropy? Is that also a part of your thinking in Web2? Yeah, I mean, I've been a longtime member of the Acti Global Community, which stands for Athletes, Conservationists, Technologists, Artists, and Innovators. It is mm -hmm. uh, now my business partner, both for the NFT company and I also run a small venture fund. Bill Tai founded that you know, over, gosh, probably like 15 or so years ago or longer. Um, and really the mission is around kind of ocean conservation and economic empowerment via entrepreneurship. So throwing things like the Necker Blockchain Summit, kind of bringing blockchain technology executives and government officials together and, you know, founded the Extreme Tech Challenge, which is the largest ecosystem for tech for good. It's kind of a global competition. Mm -hmm. That was all part of kind of the nonprofit's purview. And I joined that in about 2013. It was my first time kiteboarding. And kind of in the last, I would say from about 2018 on, bit in a more of a leadership role with community organizing and helping with that nonprofit, just volunteering on the side. So it has been something that I've been passionate about because I like to kiteboard. I've seen, you know, going back to places over the years, kind of degradation of coral reefs, you know, from when I first went to the Great Barrier Reef and 01 diving to, you know, over the years. And so it's something that I'm passionate about. So yes, like Philip. Philanthropy has been something that I've done, you know, more on like a volunteer basis and helping that nonprofit specifically. So what happens? Are you in a meeting and you start to hear about these kind of issues and it's like, hmm, well, we should make a move into that area? Well, actually, what, what happened is Bill was investing in Dapper Labs in 2018 and mm -hmm. told Roam, the CEO and still CEO, that he would invest in the company if they made a special crypto kitties, which was really one of the early NFT companies where, you know, there's basically these digital cats that would breed and create other cats. So that's crypto kitties and create a crypto kitty that looked like a turtle cat. And we name it Hanu Kitty, which in Hawaiian means turtle cat. And we actually mm -hmm. auctioned it off at the Necker Blockchain Summit. I think they raised about 50 grand or something. And then we donated it to Captain Paul Watson to park a boat off the coast of Antigua to 
protect a turtle nesting area from poachers. And that's mm-hmm. really the first NFT for ocean conservation. And I was, you know, part of the community at the time. I remember learning about NFTs. I didn't buy a crypto kitty at that time. It took me fast forward a few years until they launched NBA Top Shot in 2021, where I was like, wow, this is really interesting. It's basically like baseball trading cards, but digital and being done for the NBA. And I, you know, we know how this behavior has worked really well, you know, offline with baseball trading cards. If they can do this digitally, like this is going to be huge. And as we know, it it was, you know, Dapper Labs grew tremendously from 2018 to now. Mm -hmm. So you're doing that for a little bit. What moves you to the point where you're going to go, okay, I'm going to make on-chain monkeys myself, not, not make it yourself, but I'm going to actually make a collection and, you know, what, what pulls you in? Yeah. So it kind of goes back to Acti Global. We wanted to do an NFT campaign that would benefit the nonprofit. So, you know, we, we found an artist, very well-known artist, and we tried to launch a collection on OpenSea. And we just realized that it wasn't particularly easy for a nonprofit to do that. And what we originally thought, you know, digital assets are programmable assets, which means every time an NFT sells, you should be able to give a certain portion, you know, back to the creator. But it just, it wasn't, it wasn't a very smooth process. We'll just say for like a nonprofit to set, set, set that up. And so our original concept was let's create an open sea where every collection has some portion going to charity, right? Some, something doing mm-hmm. good in the world. Then Bill, my co-founder, and anyone who doesn't know Bill Ty, you know, he's been in crypto since 2010. He was the first investor in Zoom. He seeded Dapper Labs, Canva, now 23 public traded companies. He introduced me to Danny. Danny Yang is now my other co-founder and C- CEO. Danny founded the Stanford Bitcoin meetup in 2013, actually where Vitalik went and actually pitched for funding for Ethereum, if you can believe that. So very OG. Right. And he founded MyCoin, which is the largest cryptocurrency exchange in Taiwan. And he founded Bloxier, which he sold in 2018. And Bill got us together. And, you know, we raised a little, little, little pre, pre-seed and, you know, we set along our merry way of like kind of at first thinking about doing this marketplace play. Then ultimately, Danny, who has a PhD in computer science from Stanford, was just kind of trying to challenge himself on whether he could get 10,000 profile picks in a single Ethereum transaction because it actually never been done before, which means, you know, Mm -hmm. they're all on chain, they're all code. So they're not JPEG. This is actually each of these monkeys are code and whether it's possible to do it in that efficient manner. And he literally just like did it on the side, launched it. You know, I get a, I get a WhatsApp message, you know, Bill, Danny and I are on this continual WhatsApp Hey, I just launched on chain monkey. You might want to mint one of these, you know, within four hours, it was a free mint. They were all gone. Then we just kind of went fully into on-chain monkey. So that's kind of the crazy story of how it started. We're not, it wasn't a typical NFT mint where you have a huge discord, you have a huge Twitter, like a tons of marketing up front. Mm-hmm. It was literally like a, a kind of stealth Danny coding project, which then just took off and, you know, this incredible community was built around it. So, you know, the first thing is you have to design the on-chain monkey. So how do you go about doing that? And how difficult is the creative process of coming up with the 10,000 images? So, I mean, it, it, it's very difficult technically what Danny did to put, you know, 10,000 profile pics. There's a great Medium article he wrote, kind of the making of on-chain monkey, where he kind of explains how he was able to kind of code these 10,000 monkeys with different traits. So we talk about NFT traits, you know, there are gold monkeys, there's cheetah fur monkeys, there's aquifer monkeys, you know, there's different backgrounds, there's, you know, earrings, hats, there's all these traits that make them kind of more rare or less rare, very difficult to, to create that. So that that was literally a, a first very historic collection. Um, now that's a, that's a creative process. So are you going, hmm, the ears are not big enough. The, you got to work on the eyes. You know, what are we going to do about the mouth before you even get to the traits? You know, yeah, how are you? I mean, for that for that first collection it was really, how do we make the, and they were SVG files. How do you make the file size small enough so it could be done in a single Ethereum transaction? Mm-hmm. When we launched our Karma collection, which is a really cool story, it was actually one of our community members created a derivative on-chain monkey of his own genesis and people liked it so much. He got so many likes and people were asking him, how, how do I get one myself that we reached out to him? It turned out he was part of the um, Academy Award nominated team behind Ice Age 
Rio and Ferdinand. So he was, you know, right. very, very experienced animator. He brought a couple of his friends on and for nine months, then they literally worked on a more hand painted collection. Right. So we kind of went from hardcore technology to, you know, swinging the other end, like very detailed art. Now those monkeys were things where they were debating the traits and, you know, how would the ears look and how would the eyes look and what does it mean to have a stick coming out of your mouth and have a, a bird or a butterfly? They, they, they kind of debated all of the creative process behind that. And for those, those are JPEGs, but they are all, you know, the metadata are all on train, uh, all on chain. So we can, you know, use those in future collections as well. Okay, so you put up the collection, you do no marketing, you do you have no Discord, you have no Facebook group, you have nothing. Boom, overnight you have a community. What what's the next thought? I mean, it was insane those first 24 hours. We had not really managed a Discord before. And as anyone knows, there's a lot of you know, it takes, you know, some moderation to make sure that people like follow our values of respect and integrity, you know, in those discords. So we were just very fortunate that a number of community members just kind of stepped up and started moderating and helping to, you know, moderate for us. And then, you know, very early on, we announced kind of those rise values, which was, you know, respect, treat everyone with respect, integrity, you know, operate with the highest ethical standards, sustainability, build for the future and enrichment. We want to create wealth for our community such that they can then do good in the world. And then that really attracted this community of, you know, sure, there were some DGENs that were kind of flipping NFTs just to try to make, you know, a quick profit. But over the long term, you know, we've only had one or 2% of our Genesis NFTs ever for sale. People really are passionate about our community and, you know, excited to be part of it, you know, three weeks into the collection launching, we decided to auction one of our Genesis monkeys and it ended up selling for 12.5 ETH. It was actually Roam from Dapper Labs and Charlie Lee, the creator of Litecoin, who are both investors who bid it up. And then we decided to donate, you know, all of those proceeds to the Giga Connect project, which is mapping out schools globally and bringing internet to schools globally. It's a UNICEF and ITU initiative. And again, that was just us feeling like, you know, again, Web3, we want to enrich our communities and absolutely help them create wealth. And wealth can mean financial wealth. It can mean social connectivity. It can be physical health. It can be impact. But we also want to do good along the way. So I think, you know, we set that as an example just three weeks into the collection launching, which was very different. And it's still very different than most NFT collections in terms of just the ethos and the culture that we decided to adopt. So, you know, in Web3, we always hear this thing about how communities have to grow. You know, it's important that people are trading so that the value keeps increasing, and yet you want to keep the community. So how do you manage a community and make sure that we're going in the right direction in terms of good, but we're also going in the right direction in terms of it's becoming more valuable? Yeah, Um well, one thing we did, so, you know, I mentioned the Genesis launch, then, you know, always as a team, we've thought about how do we create more value for our community? So we did that 10,000 free mint. Then we did an airdrop of 10,000 desserts. So anyone who had a Genesis monkey got a dessert. The 20 rarest of those that were selling for $200,000. So you could have like come in for you know, $23 gas fees, 200,000 dropped to you. Then we did our public mint of Karma, which again was that Hollywood animation team designed mint. And we, for that Karma mint, that, that was a, a paid mint, we put 50% of our revenues into a DAO. So anyone who's an NFT holder can propose projects and get funding from our DAO. And roughly there's, you know, $4 million in that. So, you know, that, that, that's probably one of the highest, in fact, I think it's the highest I've ever heard of any NFT collection, putting a percentage of their mint revenues into mm -hmm. a DAO. And the statement we were making there is really that web three is about decentralization, right? But in our view, you don't just hand the keys of the car, you know, you didn't just hand it over like hundred percent to the community. We believe in kind of progressive decentralization. So, you know, we've had two seasons of our DAO where we've set the kind of themes. The first one was OCM brand and community building. And people did incredible things. People started businesses out of it. Like there's one called NFT canvases. People did creative endeavors. There was a gentleman who created a bunch of on-chain monkey theme songs and like AR, VR filters that got, get funded through the DAO. We had a few people in Brazil that literally found an unusable skate park area 
and they rehabilitated it. And if you look from top down, it looks like a monkey. So they, you know, kind of created the space for their community. And then they did a Brazilian rap competition there. So this was all funded season one of the Dow, right? Through through kind mm -hmm. of them asking for funding, our community then voting for it to, to go forward. So when you ask kind of like, how do you keep a community engaged? It's again, always thinking, how do you create value for, for your community, but how do you also create a way for your community to build alongside you? And I think that's really what our DAO is doing is kind of incentivizing and giving the means for our community to also build alongside us. You know, when we say decentralized, you know, uh, Solana was not really so decentralized, right? In the end, even Ethereum's not so decentralized. The only one that really isn't affected is Bitcoin because it is completely decentralized. So, you know, making things on Bitcoin, how important is that for the future of uh, NFTs and just, you know, this medium we're talking about? I mean, we feel it's the future. I mean, we're really shaping the future of digital assets through technology, art, and community. As you know, Bitcoin has double the market cap of Ethereum. Uh, Ethereum, Solana, Polygon, they all got huge value in their ecosystems when NFTs became you know, part of those L1s. And Bitcoin is really the only L1 that has not had that kind of bump through NFTs. So, you know, we see a lot of potential to put very high value assets on the Bitcoin blockchain. And we're, you know, very excited to be kind of helping to build not only our collection, but really kind of bringing that whole not quite, I wouldn't call it industry yet. It's still early. I don't, I don't know if oral industry. I'd say NFTs might be an industry, but, you know, kind of that, that whole group of, of innovators forward. And, you know, one example of that is just this collection we're doing with Asprey Bugatti. I mean, Asprey is literally, it was, I think, founded in 1781. You know, they did some of the furniture for the Titanic, right? So like century old brand, centuries old brand, Bugatti, one of the most luxurious car brands, they could have worked with anyone. In fact, I think originally they were looking at Ethereum. They saw what we were doing with our new collection dimensions and they you know, asked, can you help us do this? Can you basically bring these physical eggs that we're creating, create a 3D version of that? And we want, you know, there's a lot of our holders who are really big Bitcoin people and we want to bring it to Bitcoin. And can you help us do that? So we were really kind of the only company that could you know, help them do that. And that, yeah, we, we see huge value. And, and when we talk about bringing things forward, sure, it's great MetaGood's doing that. But to anyone like, you know, Senator Warren, who says that NFTs or, or, or certain digital assets are only valuable if you can throw a dart at them, like we're proving them differently, right? Like we're actually, we are bringing very high value assets. These, these have sold for, some of them are selling for millions, but they'll be selling for, you know, over 500,000 pounds, these, these NFTs. So things are going along, they're going pretty good. And then boom, we have an implosion of the market in some sense. Where are we today? You know, what's what's happening today? Has have things settled down? Are we are we building? Is it a bubble that burst and you know, whoever survives long enough is gonna succeed? You know, how do you how do you see the the you know where we are today? I mean, I think people forget that it's just really early days for NFTs. I mean, we mentioned Dapper Labs 2018, but really the NFT market didn't take off, I would say until 2021. And, you know, I looked, it was funny, my co-founder Danny did a tweet that, you know, he was there when Bitcoin hit a hundred, then a thousand, then back down to 175. And, you know, when Ethereum hit a thousand, then down to 78. So, you know, these fluctuations happen and especially in new and innovative markets where things aren't fully understood by most. And we really believe that, you know, quality stands out, out over time and, you know, looking for that quality in a bear market is what people should be doing. So, you know, I guess the, the TLDR is we're super early and there's going to be market fluctuations, but NFTs are not going away for sure. I mean, I think even Galaxy Digital reported maybe a month ago that the ordinal space alone, so NFTs on ordinals, within a year and a half could be a five to $10 billion market, right? And if you look at the NFT market today, globally, I think we're at like roughly a, a $15 billion market. So it's it's still very, very early days. And what do you see the, the you know, value for creators, you know, for, for new, for people who are watching this and don't know much about it, what's the value of them working in this medium? And what do you think it's, what do you see the, 
the technological opportunities coming up are? Well, I think the thing we're most excited, well, I was most excited about whether you're a musician or an artist or any type of creator, bringing your medium to NFTs was the fact that they're digital programmable assets, which means, you know, unlike a painting where once it's sold from the studio, every time it's sold after that as the creator, you really don't get anything back for that. So what's really powerful about these digital programmable assets is you could put in a royalty like five, 10%. So every time an NFT is sold as a creator, you can have that back. Now that has changed in the near term with some of the things that have been going on with Blur and OpenSea, but on a go forward, there will be ways to, I think, enforce, you know, some type of royalties for creators. And I think that's, what's most exciting is, is again, like, just like there are royalties for musicians, although sometimes those are hard to <laughs> to get. Uh, yeah. Ideally, you know, for 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 also for any other creators that are creating you know works and putting them on the blockchain, our belief is that there should be ways for you know creators to get royalties from that. And frankly, to like intermediate the middle people that have been you know long time takes in their you know in their revenue stream, be it you know, the record labels or the, you know, art galleries, like this is a way for artists and creators to connect directly to their fans and to their patrons, basically. And, you know, you can buy directly from them on any number of marketplaces, both musicians and, you know, traditional artists, instead of having a huge cut and really like a, a gating factor to who's being, you know, shown dependent on, you know, an art gallery kind of curating that and or a record label. You know, traditionally a record label would do the marketing, right? And there's a lot of NFT collections that don't happen. Your collection sold out with any effort, although you were already in the community and knew a lot of people, you know, to an artist who's just coming in, what would you say to them? You know, because there are some things they have to do that they didn't have to do. The record label or the manager would do, you know, now they have to manage those opportunities themselves is is that a point of difference is that a consideration yeah i mean i don't it's probably not for every artist or musician to try to go direct to their fan base i'd say i mean but there are other platforms too outside of just nfts i mean i know there's a number of integrations into you know shopify where like even if you're selling merch directly to your fans you know you can work with different platforms to kind of sell directly but you know there is a, a woman named violetta zaroni who is like fully web3 as an artist you know she issued her own nft collection um people can own some of the rights in her songs that own you know certain nfts and i know you know it, it's definitely a lot of work like promoting yourself right and and making a name for yourself and it, it probably isn't right for every artist to have to do that but it is it is a way to you know at least you know as a musician kind of be more sustainable is is using these digital assets to kind of support yourself directly with your fans do you see the life of an artist changing, you know, from the way they were an artist before because of the potential of Web3? You know, do you see, you know, we're talking about musicians. Musicians are easy to talk about, but do you see filmmakers and more traditional artists being able to express themselves through this medium? Yeah. And I mean, again, I'm I'm not like probably... I'm not trying as an artist, try to trying to do that myself. So I, I don't want to speak for all artists. And again, I, I don't think it's certainly not for everyone, but there's certainly been authors like I think, you know, Ben Mesrick launched his own NFT collection to help support some of the books that he's written. Like he wrote like Bitcoin Billionaires. There's other books that he was writing that, you know, I think he was able to raise some funds through that. I know like we've been approached by some different film directors Dan Sickles is, is one that is creating a, a movie around NFTs, and he also created his own NFT collection with characters of the people that are going to be in the um, in the movie. So I, I think there's like an mandatory NFT you can <laughs> um, like. It's are like you going to get your you going to get your own NFT? I, I have mine. Yeah, there's like a, it's like a monkey tail because I have a monkey, and then it's like kind of like profile pic, which has this kind of pink fiery hair. And I usually wear some type of blazer at these NFT conferences. So it was like a white blazer mm. monkey. Yeah. So yeah, so you can mix and match. I mean, and he was very smart. He, he got a lot of kind of like NFT influencers. And so, yeah, that was a way to fundraise for his movie. So I think it's still, again, early days. People are experimenting with how to do it. But uh, you know, yeah. you, you worked in web two for a long time. So now you're in Web3, do you feel like the people are different or is it the same people who are in Web2 now have learned how to work in Web3 and, and, or is there something about people who are attracted to Web3? 
Yeah, I mean, I think, well, one thing that's really different, the work paradigm of Web 2 and Web 3 is, I think Web 2, you know, you have a job and you might, you know, now with COVID, people don't necessarily commute in, but you, you commute in to your job and you're there however many hours you go home, right? I feel like Web 3, no one really seems to have, like some pe- very few people have, like obviously as a founder, this is my full-time thing, but like a lot of people are able to take on many different jobs. And that's what's kind of interesting with this anonymity of Web3 and you kind of choose your own avatar or what you want to show. I mean, we have a number of community members who are in our Discord who, you know, I don't actually know their names. I might just, you know, I just know them by their Discord name. And a lot of these people, you know, if you have a skill set, if you're good at, let's say you're you're good at video editing or social media, you could actually have, you know, multiple customers. And that's very normal in Web3 to kind of have multiple gigs. And that's a little different than kind of the old kind of web two model. And it's also very global. And I'd say things happen much faster in web three than web two. I mean, I I sometimes feel like the two years we've been at Metagood and dog years feels much longer from a a work perspective. It's also much more 24 seven. I mean, just because our community at OnChain Monkey, for example, 45% of our holders are global. So you know, there are chats in our Discord, which are happening, you know, 24 seven. Thankfully, we have moderators kind of covering different hours. I don't need to be on all the time, but that was not really the case. And it didn't feel that way, the same kind of urgency, speed, and kind of global nature. Yeah. I didn't feel the same way from at least working in the States. So, you know, so do you feel like that global thing is one of the added benefits? And, and, you know, when, everything imploded. Are we still, the people who are still here, still working this every day, do you think it's a more, it was good that some of that washed out and, and we're building again? Yeah. I mean, I think with any bull market, it's easier for things just to be frothy and, you know, everything kind of looks good in a bull market. And that's kind of going back to that comment of like, quality standing out in a bear market and looking for that quality is, is key, right? And the people that are still you know, laying their bricks every day in Web3 who are, you know, I would say doxxed, you know, venture funded. So we're, we were very lucky. We closed a pre-seed round back in December, but, you know, we're not just an NFT collection. We're, we're building a, a full company, right, at Metagood. And so, yeah, we're, we're, not, we're not going anywhere. Well, it sounds exciting, you know, so thank you for talking to me today and appreciate it. Sure. It was, it, was, it was fun. I mean, I was, I, our panel was so, it felt like it just went by in a blink at NFTLA. So yeah, I was yeah, excited to uh, get to spend a little bit more time with you and, and uh, yeah. I yeah, you too. The time. You too. Well, I look forward to catching up with you again soon. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay.